Okay, um, so one of, the, one of the interesting things about uh, CDOC CRM to start off with, coming, coming from the other presentations, is that we're ahead of our time. Um, I think it was Margaret Masterman at, at Cambridge who said that you, you don't wait for the technology to catch up with you, you let it catch up with you later. Um, you do what's right and, and then and you're not led by technology. And we haven't been led by technology at all. That'll come out in this presentation. Um, but fortunately, the technology has reached a point, a point of maturity, where we can start producing applications that make use of this. Uh, and uh, Steve was talking about CRM inf and argumentation. But one of the applications that we're looking uh, to use CRM inf for um, initially is for school children. This is a communication device that actually can transcend lots of different groups, whether it's academics, researchers. Uh, or whether it's school children or local historic societies or whatever. And these are communication systems that we can use to transcend all of these different bodies. So I'm Dominic Oldman. I'm a senior curator at the uh, British Museum. I'm talking about how we can use CDOC CRM uh, strategically and uh, how we can use it for open knowledge representation, a whole range of different um, uh, projects and uh, organisations. Uh, and this is uh, the presentation in a nutshell. It's talking about strategy, really. So technology and the digital humanities at the moment, uh, technology is very fragmented. Uh, projects are quite fragmented. We, we find it fairly easy to collaborate within a project and digital cl collaborate within a project. But, to, but transferring knowledge from a project to another project is very, very difficult. We, we publish journals. We publish applications. Uh, we even have services, but actually transferring knowledge from one project to another, building on the knowledge of another project, is extremely difficult, and that's what CDOC CRM does extremely well. Uh, and we need innovation, but we still need stability and sustainability. So Martin was talking earlier about the fact that we build this thing very slowly. Uh, it's backwardly compatible. It's about stability, because we need an infrastructure of stability in order to be able to build layers of knowledge on top of each other, and that's really important. An emphasis on knowledge representation and not technology. Um, so uh, we are not technology-led, as I said before, uh, and people are very important to this process. Uh, and we'll talk about that. We've got a, a model called the uh, Synergy model. Uh, it's a reference model for data provisioning, and it's about people. It's about how you interact with people and organizations. We want to enfranchise data providers. So researchers uh, are often in some of these uh, knowledge organizations, but museums uh, like the British Museum and other smaller organizations as well, they provide data, they generate knowledge locally, uh, and it's very important that there is a, uh, a connection between what we do as researchers and those knowledge organizations. And CDOC CRM is about bringing those, those people together. And we want to encourage collaboration uh, of those people as well. And one of the really big things in terms of computer science is we're not be able to reason up across these heterogeneous data sets. This is a really big challenge. No one's ever done this. And we are getting close to this in terms of being able to harmonize data and then use computer logic across all of it. Um, and some of the uh, issues that I'll bring up in this presentation are actually published in an article that uh, Martin and uh, Thomas Whitman here and uh, Barry Norton and Gerald de Jong. Uh, we wrote it uh, this year. It's about trying to learn from the last 20 years. We've been very computer-led, very technology-led for the last uh, 20 years, uh, and this has caused problems, and I think it's wasted uh, a lot of money as well. Millions and millions and millions have gone on different projects trying to aggregate cultural heritage and humanities data uh, and it's uh, simply faded away or failed. And so this is very much about cost efficiency as well as anything else. And CRM itself, we've heard a lot about uh, the core ontology and also some of the extensions. It's about relations, explicit and implicit. So I just put here uh, a museum database. We'll have a, a, an underlying database system. It will have business rules. It will have a user interface. And a lot of the information is contained in all of these different layers. But it's also contained in the people itself. So mapping to CDOC CRM is not a, necessarily just a technical exercise, but it's about bringing out some of the implicit relationships that appear in these different layers, and also taking the knowledge of the people who created that data in the first place and trying to encode that into a much fuller picture 
and that's really important. It's event-based, so we can start doing historical analysis. It's very much based on the real world, a uh, real-world analysis. We're about taking local resources and making them global, making a larger global resource that is harmonized together. That means we can start doing inference and reasoning across it, as I said. It's bottom-up. So unlike a lot of projects, it's not mashing together a lot of existing ontologies. It is uh, an expert insight across many disciplines. Uh, so we're taking empirical evidence. We're bringing people into our meetings. We're letting them present, present about how they do things on the ground in their knowledge organizations. And we're encoding that into the CDOC CRM. Uh, and people, as I said, extremely important. Knowledge experts uh, become very important to the CDOC CRM. It's not top-down, it's not artificial, it's not a committee trying to determine what uh, should be uh, the standard. And it's not a core model, and I think that's come up uh, also in some of the slides. So CDOC CRM, 1995, a very, very important year. Um, it was important because uh, we started to realize that trying to put together lots of information across lots of cultural heritage organizations was very, very difficult in a traditional database model in what we call an entity relationship model. Yes, well, bigger and bigger and bigger, and more unwieldy, uh, more complex, uh, and difficult to actually then implement. Um, and so that's where the CDOC CRM came from, is about trying to solve the issue of complexity, about try these expanding, uh, expanding models. Uh, and at that time, um, people were resorting to core models. So this was becoming so, so complicated that actually a lot of the projects said the only way to solve this is to create core fixed models, fixed schemas, and that's get people to try and fit their data into that. And we'll look at some slides about what happens when that, that's the case. But they're not only fixed schemas, but they're also overly generalized. Um, and in 1995, not only were we thinking, well, this is extremely complex and we need to do something about it, but actually people in the cultural heritage sector themselves, people like David Behrman in 1995, writing articles saying it's essentially impossible to bring data from existing museum automation systems into a common view. They realized that from projects back in the 1990s. This is the Museum Educational Site Licensing Project in America. This is trying to pull together images from lots of different museums. And also RAMA in this country, in Europe, a European Commission funded project, Remote Access to Museum Archives, which Oxford was part of. Um, also had this issue with trying to bring together lots of heterogeneous sources into a core model and meaning getting lost and then the benefits becoming lost and then the applications not being very useful. And these are all in intertwined into the same equation. And this is what you get. Um, I don't want to pick on Europeana particularly, but, and I think this applies to many different uh, um, uh, aggregation projects, but here's a record. It's coming from... Uh, Tyne and Weir, uh, and in fact, if you look this up, uh, this no longer exists. This is one of the issues about data provisioning and keeping your relationship with a data provider. And of course, these things change, these identifiers uh, change, so you can't actually use that, that link to get to this record, which I've taken from their, their new website. Every time a website changes, the identifiers on the web page changes. And you can see here that it's type image, so there's a confusion here about what this is. This is an object, this is a physical object but actually there's confusion because of the generalizations in the ontology. People have mistaken this and said, well, we're actually describing a, an image, so that the inference is that, this, that the, the ancient Egyptians could take digital images. Um, some of the data is squeezed into these fields, so it's uh, pulled together. Um, uh, some of the subject uh, material here, archaeology and Egyptian, is actually coming from a different part of the record uh, in the in the data, the local database, so we're starting to squeeze knowledge into these ontologies, or misunderstand what they're for, or misunderstand the generalizations, and you end up with with very poor poor records, which don't represent, in fact, misrepresent uh, the organisation. This is another example. This is from the Fitz uh, Museum in the Fitzwilliam Museum in in Oxford, uh, and again, you have type image, so there's still that there. Uh, subject mummy mask, or this is really coming from a, an object type field. And again, there's some data that's been squeezed into the description because they haven't been able to squeeze it into or put it into a, a part of the structured data. In fact, 
they could have done that structured data does uh, uh, appear in the Europeana data model but it but it's uh, but there's a misunderstanding there's no expertise in explaining to organizations how to actually put this data into the ontology in the first place which is why it's not just about ontologies and about technology it's also about people and people understanding and learning how to do this stuff so meanings are confused data is not updated links are broken uh, data is fitted into inappropriate fields, identifiers are confused, inconsistent version control and attributions, uh, and these are all issues that are affecting the way in which we do research projects in this sector, uh, and they're also um, not very good for engagement. The same sort of things that are important to researchers in terms of doing proper research, contextual research and building knowledge, um, also become important to engagement um, and consistent engagement with our audiences. This is one of the reasons, so legacy behavior. We talked uh, before about technology leading some of these things. Um, and this is uh, part of the problem. So we have people who are still linked into these closed world systems. Uh, they still think of uh, data in terms of rows and columns. Uh, they're still thinking through the computer. The computer is a constraint. So they're thinking about how they represent the data. Whereas in the way we, we put the CDOC CRM together, we're thinking about open world representation. We're led by meaning. Uh, and then when we've done that, then we try and encode that into a computer technology. And that's a very different way of doing it. And actually, this is a very, very difficult thing for people to break a habit on. Um, people are still fixated on these type of constraints and find it very, very difficult to think about things in this way. So it's not because the ontologies are complicated. It's a mindset. And we need to transfer from uh, old style data processing and IT methods into this new knowledge representation system. So I wanted to cover a few of the myths then about uh, CDOC CRM as part of this. I think we've touched on some already in some of the other presentations. Uh, but one of them is about complexity. Um, so going back again to uh, 1995 when the CDOC CRM was created or developed uh, into something that um, transferred, I guess, information from the CDOCs uh, information categories. Uh, and uh, what happened was that we were able to transfer that data over and make it semantically richer, um, but reduce the amount of information that it actually held. Uh, and putting it into an object-orientated model. And this is not the same sort of object-orientated model uh, that programmers think of, in that it uses some of the same principles. And Patrick was talking about subclasses and classes. This is about inferring meaning. It's not just about a systematic uh, production of classes uh, and uh, subclasses in order to make your program work properly. It's about trying to model prop, uh, proper meaning and make sure that it's inferred up and down those uh, levels, those hierarchies of classes properly. Uh, and I found this on the, the web. Uh, programmers speak out, you don't need ontology for understanding, you have me. Well, actually, the CDOC CRM and ontologies are about a collaboration of people getting together. You can't do CDOC CRM mapping uh, unless you talk to the experts in each individual area, whether it's the technician, the data manager, or the people who understand the data in the first place. So it's really, in this, this type of uh, uh, state, it's, it's readily extensible. We can extend it. We've seen uh, uh, examples of specializations, uh, and they're easier to manage. Um, and it reduces unnecessary detail. So once we start getting into more terminological ontologies, we sort of lose it, and we start getting into arguments about what should go where, uh, and different organizations have different ideas at that, that level. So we don't get down to that level unless you want to do a specialization uh, that you think is necessary. Um, and I guess that, that's, that's basically it. So I'm, I'm going to give you some examples of why uh, there's an issue about complexity. So this is um, a horrible thing, and this is, looks like a horrible thing at the same time. Uh, this is, in fact, uh, the British Museum's data model for its collections database, uh, full of lots of tables, entities, I guess, with the relationships that go across these little lines, if you can see the detail, uh, lots of those joining tables together, joining information together. And this is a representation of uh, our mapping to the CDOC CRM, uh, little lines going to little bubbles. But if I actually magnify that, this is looking at the same thing. So this is the data model of the British Museum looking at something called associated events. And actually, it's 
it's extremely difficult to actually understand what this is doing. Now, these things are equivalent. This is a model, and this is a model. Unfortunately, because actually this is more, this is the ironic thing about it, because this is more accessible, uh, people don't see it in the same way, and they don't compare the two. And they say this is more complicated. This is very complicated, because we never give them this representation. And that's one of the big problems. But you would never understand what this actually meant. But actually what it means is, in CDOG CRN terms, is that we have an object that was present at an event. These all things are all typed as events. Uh, it was made for an event. So this is another association code that comes out of here. Um, and uh, it was also present at an exhibition. So the semantics are clear. You can actually read it. Um, if you're not au okay, uh, with this stuff, you can have a look at the CDOC CRM one. You can focus in and view in uh, and uh, zoom in on certain areas. And you can actually read it. You can't read it with these models. These are hugely complicated. And so the equivalent, I think you can see, is that CDOC CRM actually gives you a richer semantic representation, which is readily accessible. So myth two, contextual information is only for researchers. This is a, a GISC uh, summit I went to a, a couple of years ago. Um, and they have these voting systems. So you go in and uh, it, someone comes up with a, uh, uh, an idea and people vote for it. And what people voted for by a long, long way was more contextual data. Uh, it came above all of these other ones. And the panel at the end said they couldn't believe it. They couldn't believe that that was the most popular thing that people wanted. Uh, they thought there was some sort of bias in the audience. Um, but we had, there was a sort of debate about it. Uh, and one of the people on the panel who was a developer, and what happens at these conferences is the developers have their conference two days earlier, and they all leave. <laughs> and then they bring us in as researchers and academics to discuss it without the developers. These things are completely separated off. Uh, but someone from the developers group was on, on the panel. Conceptual reference models are generally more popular with the curators. I don't know if there's any curators here who use a conceptual reference model at the moment. Then with developers, it's not clear to me how we solve the problem of engaging people who want to do the development. So I think what that actually implies is that programmers are not interested in the subject matter. They're only interested in being able to produce applications. Uh, but of course, the quality and the, the benefits of the application depend on understanding and being interested in the subject matter. So that's uh, pretty difficult. If we find that the risks are starting to become too great and the value is so poor because the data is being misused or used incorrectly or inappropriately, if that's a risk to society in general and not just to the curators, and just remember that curators are about communicating to different audiences, that's their job. It's about interpreting and then, and then uh, putting out uh, messages and explaining things to a whole range of different people then we're going to have to find new kinds of solutions. So first question is, why are developers, why, why is technology leading and determining this risk? Um, and actually, probably this risk has already happened. And that's why we're spending lots of money again and again and uh, wasting potential resources. So just, sorry. <laughs> Oh, right, yes. So anybody who's seen uh, another presentation that I do knows that I, I go on about this a lot. Um, it's partly because I, I'm, I, well, this example comes from the fact that I come from Lowstoff. This is a, a summarized view. I'd usually do a much longer one that um, will probably bore a lot of people who've already seen it already. But what the point that it's trying to make is that Lowstoff, which is an easily, um, uh, most easily point in Great Britain, and the, point, uh, the, the first um, place of human habitation in Great Britain, so it has a, a long history to it. It uh, has different perspectives in different museums and, in, and probably in, in different, uh, uh, other, different, other, uh, different knowledge organizations like archives and, and also libraries as well. But these are, these are museums mostly. So the British Museum has Lowstoff porcelain, uh, also has uh, prints and drawings uh, which relate to the coast. So this is a, a picturesque view off the coast of, of Suffolk. It's, it's Lowstoff spelt in its old, old language. Um, it's a print after um, uh, Turner, um, and there are also other Turners in, in other organizations as well. Metropolitan has people, portraits of people who came from Lowestoft. Suffolk was a, um, quite a wealthy county, lots of landowners, um, and lots of them moved out to, to America. This is the Rijksmuseum. This is the Battle of Lowestoft uh, in the 17th century. That's a commemorative uh, medal from the Maritime Museum, National Maritime Museum, commemorating that battle. 
Uh, this is an actual oil painting from the Tate of the Lowstoff Bowl. So this is porcelain. Um, it's done, it's done in, a, in the style of uh, a later style, but it's, it's referring again to Lowstoff and to porcelain. Uh, this is the train that brought uh, people in and fish out, because uh, Lowstoff is a, a fishing town for a long, a long while. Uh, so these, these things are in the National Railway Museum. This is the Metropolitan, a trifle from Lowstoff, another piece of porcelain, and there are other bits and pieces as well. So in the National Gallery, uh, National Museums in Scotland, they have models of boats that came in and out of, of Lowestoft. And actually, if you go to the archives up the coast of Britain, you lo see lots of different um, perspectives of the fishing industry. This is a, a boat called the Star of Scotland. It's the one, the model is in the Museum of Scotland. This is in an archive somewhere. Um, it was actually changed names when it was um, bought by uh, the fishing owner or the fishing fleet owner in Lowestoft, so it's a change to the Jamaica. In the uh, regional museum in Aberdeen, it's got the whole schematic of that boat. Uh, pictures. The, here it is in Lowestoft, um, in Lowestoft Harbour. My dad worked on this boat. Okay, so there are personal connections to these things. Um, this is um, a muirhead bone uh, in the National Gallery in Washington. This is Lowestoft, autumn in Lowestoft. This is a pub in Lowestoft called the Joseph Conrad. Uh, and this is uh, a biography of Conrad saying that he learned English when he landed in Lowestoft. That's where he came from, went from Poland, lands in Lowestoft, and he learns English from the fishermen, and the fishing people. And does all the trips up and down uh, the coast uh, to Scotland, uh, up the East Coast. And that's where he meets Muirhead Bone. And there's a muirhead bone of Conrad in the British Museum. And there are other ones. This is in the Tate. But the point I make about this is there's no connection between any of these in the data. This is all my work. Uh, and these are all things that potentially the CDOC CRM can help us establish uh, through computers. And that's very engaging as well. So this crosses over from the way in which we are starting to work with big data as researchers uh, and also an engagement. So this is sort of really interesting engagement for people who put in their own hometown and start bringing up stuff that they never realized was connected to, to, to them. But this is something about unsystematic uh, research from uh, Max Siebold. You find things by the wayside or you buy a brochure written by a local historian which is in a tiny museum somewhere which you'll never find in London. And, that, and, and in that, you'll find some odd details which lead you somewhere else. And so it's a form of unsystematic searching, which, of course, for an academic is far from orthodoxy because we're meant to be doing things systematically. And this is a change. This is a step change in actual researchers maybe behaving a little bit by, like people who engage with the collection or who want to engage with the collection. Um, so there's an overlap here, and that's why there's an overlap with the CDOC CRM in terms of the audiences that it can reach as well. So this is, uh, this is I, I did a presentation at the British Museum when I talked about the history of the world, not in 100 objects, but in millions or whatever. Um, so what's uh, important here, um, we saw some examples of how data became more interesting the way when we put it together and where we integrated it. But actually, local catalogue information can be quite uninteresting and quite boring. Uh, lots of measurements and, and uh, uh, scientific information that actually isn't that engaging uh, may be useful to some researchers but not others. So if we want to broaden our horizons, uh, we need to think about how we can layer on new information that is of appeal to a wider audience. Uh, and this is, this is one of the issues. So lots of people think that quality is about accuracy. Well, actually, it doesn't matter. See, I mean, there's an example of the fact that we can... Uh, in a knowledge representation system, put data up and let people, uh, in, a, in a very controlled way, and a way that we can uh, manage, uh, look at different beliefs and uh, put new propositions uh, and beliefs against them. Um, quantity is obviously uh, one of the big things that a lot of the projects go for and, uh, and have failed on uh, dismally. Meaning and context is important, so it doesn't really matter how much data that you put up, whether it's correct or not, 
What's important is you give the context for it, because once you give the context for it, then you can start having these debates, then you can start layering on more information, and then you can start having a more stable relationship with knowledge organizations in terms of your research. So that's what's um, important. And when we start doing that, then we can start layering on the significance and relevance information. But until we do that, there'll be a disjoint between the two things, and we'll still have uh, fairly dusty catalog information. So myth free, it's too large and theoretical. Um, well, it has been, well, it was for a little bit, but um, luckily I haven't been involved the last 30 years of development, only the last five, I guess, so um, I've missed out all of that, and I'm interested in producing applications out of this. Um, so I've, I've missed all the hard work, and I get to do all the exciting work. Um, but ultimately, as, as uh, we heard before, that you pick what you want. You don't have to use the whole ontology. Um, and it's quite compact in, 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 any, in any way, because um, what it's doing, it is uh, representing a whole sector in very, very few entities and very, very few properties. The BM only uses 48 of the 90 entities, uh, and some of those in a very light way, and 50 properties. But actually, a lot of the examples that you have in some of the other aggregation projects could use a lot less. You just pick what you want. If you only use one part of the CRM, then you're producing contextual information that can be integrated with another one, uh, another uh, source of information, uh, and this is extremely useful. So when we start talk, thinking in terms of very, very big data, it's not the quantity, but it's the context, and it's not how many of the CRM entities and properties you use, it's the fact that you start using them. Uh, the point I think about this is, has been made before about the levels of knowledge. So this is coming from the CDOC CRM itself. So up here you have some, something that's quite generalized, a thing, a man-made thing, a physical man-made thing, a man-made object. But the point is, depending on your level of knowledge, you apply the right level, but it will still be integrated with other people's uh, information, uh, regardless of whether they had more uh, knowledge about their objects or, or less. This is, this is part of the hierarchical system that allows us to integrate across different data sources. And of course, it, it takes into account lots of different types of objects. You don't use all of them. You pick the right level. Uh, and, and that's what um, makes, in the end, your, your, your implementation of CDOC CRM smaller than the actual model itself. So practical applications. Um, I heard a, a, a talk um, given recently about macroscopes. Um, so I wanted to talk a little bit about this because uh, although um, CDOC CRM as a core is very compact, um, it still um, can be a little bit unwieldy when you access it as a user. So a lot of what we do is behind the scenes. It's a model. It's equivalent to the, the sort of ER models that we were talking about before. They're not intended for people to use. When we put them into applications, uh, we need uh, ways of making them accessible um, uh, for, for lots of different types of user. So um, we have a, a system, actually, if I talk about this first. So this is the BM's collections online. Uh, it has the usual sort of keyword search. It has advanced boxes for all the terminologies. And what we found is that no one uses these at all. Everybody uses uh, the keyword search. Um, even the curators in the museum never use these because uh, on, the, on the data itself, when you're searching the BM collection, you don't need to you get enough uh, precision and recall balance in the keyword search to make that unnecessary. So no one actually uses any of this stuff at all. But of course, when you start widening out, when you start integrating data, this becomes less and less useful, and you actually need to go to some of this precision. But still, there's no context to any of those drop-down boxes. Uh, and so this is a big issue. But if you've got something that is represented in the way that CDOC CRM represents your data, then you can do some really interesting things. So this is another example uh, going to keyword searches as well. So I'm putting in Portland Vars, and I get a lot of information. I get 289,000 uh, results in 0.84 seconds, which is um, quite gratifying. Uh, but I don't necessarily get what exactly I want. And if I start putting in context, so influenced by Rembrandt, it has no concept of that at all. There's, there's no understanding of that, that phrase at all. We've come up, or, or Martin and others have come up, with a way in which we can condense down, like the shortcuts we were talking about, but bringing together pathways within the CDOC CRM to get a, a, an optimal level of balance, uh, an optimal level of recall and precision. It condenses down into six categories. All of the CDOC CRM 
things, people, places, events, periods, and concepts, people that pe things that people understand, and condense this down the relationships and a matrix of those things. And this is ideal for data exploration. Um, and it solves the problem of the balance between precision and recall, the problem we have with keyword searching, and the problem we have with very detailed boxes of terminology. And what we get is, is something like this. So this is a, um, a zooming into an application we produced at the British Museum, a working prototype. It uses the fundamental categories and relationships. And you can see here that it's saying uh, created or modified uh, by Rembrandt, but also gives you these options like influenced by, like about, like met. Um, so you can change the context of the search and you can get the right context for what you're doing and the, the re recall and precision is, is, is much better. We're actually then putting this into a production system that will be available um, during this year, which takes all of the fundamental categories. So this will completely change the way in which people interface with museum collections and, and with archives and hopefully uh, other, other collections as well. So here we have some symbols, um, find objects, find people or groups, find places, find events, dates or times or concepts. So if we want to find objects, we immediately are given a, a, a box to relate it to something else. So let's relate it here to an, um, an event. Destroyed in, so it automatically gives you the condensed relationships. And these can be changed, so we can change the terminology of these. If they're unfriendly, uh, they're not important uh, per se. Uh, and we can start using then our terminology. So we've got uh, an object that was destroyed in the mutiny of the bounty. And we get some results out of it. We can add to that. We can put in another relationship. So we can put in a concept like wood. And we can also filter down. So facets are normally about properties, but these are about relationships. So we can actually facet by relationship as well. And we can use the fundamental categories and relationships in the way in which we hone down on the information we want. So we start up very, very high, a macro level. We start coming in at a much more micro level. The macroscope. Um, and when we get to our results, uh, we can get to a page that gives us lots of information. Uh, but we can also save this search definition. So if I want to save that, I can start a new search. And I can say, right, I don't want to find objects. I want to find people. So I can click on people. And I can say, what's that related to? Well, I can say I want it related to objects, but I want to relate it to the search that I just did. So I can relate back to destroyed in the mutually abandoned data dataset, and I can get people out of it. And then I can start exploring these people, and I can create collections of people. I can start a new search based on that person, and I can use the relationships again against that person has met. And I get results, and I can come back to, to something that is 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 um, accessible to to the uh, as as an end result. These are the sort of applications that we can produce because we've done it in a proper, in a proper knowledge representation way. We couldn't have abstracted out the fundamental categories and relationships if we hadn't done the job underneath uh, to sort out those, those, those concepts and relationships in the first place. And so we can use computer reasoning, we can use computer logic in order to make these things accessible to either uh, school children or to general audiences or to academics, we can expand out, we can contract down, uh, we can make them more precise, we can make them more abstract, depending on our audience. And we can actually allow people to configure that themselves to the right level for their project. And just one last thing about argument. Um, I haven't brought any of the, the designs uh, from the museum about that, but we've been working with Steve Stead and we are going to implement the argumentation system. So this was his belief. Uh, the object, the, ob the belief value, these are proposition sets. And the important thing about the proposition set is that they're in the same knowledge representation system as the ontology we're using to represent the rest of the, to represent this argument system. It's the same knowledge representation system that represents the object. So not only can we reason uh, across the object data, we can reason against the arguments and we can do that in parallel with the canonical data. So we can make comparisons between what's happening here in terms of argument and belief, but also what's happening in terms of the canonical data itself. And I'll finish there. Thank you.
Thank you.